looking back on everything that we've seen here in Jirash today, I really think this is my favorite ruin outside of Angkor Wat that I've ever been to. And we've been to Pompeii and we've been to Paestum and Rome and all these places. But Jordan, you wouldn't expect it to be such a rock star of archaeology. Stay tuned and I'll tell you why. Hi guys, I'm Turtle. And I'm Bear. And welcome to Jirash. This was called Garaza, and we're standing here at the very entrance in front of Hadrian's Arch. And there seems to be a Hadrian's Arch pretty much everywhere. This Hadrian's Arch is about 13 meters tall, and it was built for the time when Hadrian came to visit here. It's one of the things I loved about him because, like us, he was a traveler, and he came here in 129 AD. We're gonna go in here, and we're gonna go through a whole tour of the entire site, and this is a really large, amazing site. We just got done driving around it. We're looking forward to getting in there. We'll see you guys inside. Cheers. So before you go in, it is a very, very large site, and you're gonna wanna get hydrated, and there's, so there's some fresh pomegranate juice that you can get. We'll make sure you grab a water, because you are gonna need it by the time it's done. It's nice and cool out today, but the sun is coming down. So you can stop by and see my friend Muhammad here, very friendly gentleman. To get into the Jirash site is 10 JD, or if you have the Jordan Pass, it's included. And the first thing you're gonna see when you come into the site is the aforementioned Hadrian's Arch, and we've seen these all over the world, but somehow this one just seems special. When you come through Hadrian's Arch, you'll see this, what kind of looks like a cool wall, and there's some staircases. This is actually the backside of one of the highlights of the entire site. Yeah, so we're in the Hippodrome right now, and the Hippodrome is really well reconstructed, at least on this side. And it actually has the starting gates for the horses, and I've never seen that at another one of these Hippodromes that we've done, and we've done a few of them now. And so what you're seeing now is these arches and they would line up the chariots in the arches and they'd have some sort of like way to stop them from going. And then as soon as they were out, it was <laughs> similar like, to like modern day yeah. horse races, very dangerous version of modern day horse races. But uh, this is really a nice place. Um, later on in the usage of this, because things become things become things, mm -hmm. they actually did gladiator games down at the end that hasn't been as well reconstructed. And that was also used as like a pottery area for later people. Hmm. And so they've used this area for a long time. As a matter of fact, it's right in the middle of town as we speak, but it goes on for it's got to be at least a mile. We haven't gotten to the visitor center yet, so you won't know about this unless you watched us and show, share this with all your friends. And let's get down the road. Brendan and I might do a race. You want a race? You want to get your butt kicked? <laughs> so in Olympia, I was like 15 pounds heavier, so he really kind of tore me up in that race. And I'm wearing a little bit tighter pants today, but I've lost 15 pounds, so why not lose a little bit more gracefully? Come on, man. Yeah, drop as many likes as you can for some luck for him. <laughs> and even with dad trying to give himself a little sneaky head start, I still won pretty easily, so I don't know. Maybe he's gonna have to try to get in shape if he wants to try to beat me next time. But anyways, we wanted to uh, go over by the Hippodrome and check out that pottery area we had talked about a little bit earlier, and uh, it was pretty cool. You can see back here where it would be easy for a squatter to stay in this area as it started to collapse because all you'd have to do is put a roof over these sections and you kind of have a ready-made bedroom. And so it's down in these areas that when they were excavating it out, they were finding all of the pottery remains and all of the tools and stuff associated with pottery. And we wanted to check out the other end of the Hippodrome because later on, that was actually a place where they did gladiatorial 
competitions and activities and stuff like that. And it was pretty cool to check out. So we took a quick little look around there and then headed to the back side and that's where we found a lot of cool pottery. So just outside the back gate of the Hippodrome, there's just kind of a hill out here, but it's got at least three circular cutouts and I think there'd be a statue here or a fountain here or something. But you can tell when it was getting all filled in and they were gonna do something else with it or whatever, that there was a lot of pottery sherds all in here as part of a fill. I mean, it's like, I don't wanna pull any of them out. There's ton, there's a little bit of glass right here. <laughs> and I accidentally pull it out. Let me put it back in just a second. That's not modern glass, really old neat glass. You always put things back no matter how insignificant they are. They're not yours to take home. They belong to Jordan and its people. So this is going to be a little piece of a handle off of some sort of decorative jug or maybe a cup, but I don't know if they had cups like that at that point. This is one of the things that I really love about the classical areas is that there's so much of this that it's really just kind of left in place a lot. And so pretty much everywhere we went, Cyprus and Greece and Italy, you'll find all sorts of pottery everywhere. And being someone who would have to dig and look and search for pottery, it's, it's very refreshing and uh, it's cool, really. Not significant, but uh, significant to me. And isn't that what travel is all about? Finding something that's significant for you. Behind me is the South Gate and it was built just before the Hadrian Gate. And experts believe that it was kind of like a practice run for the Hadrian Gate. You know, they wanted a nice grandiose gate, um, but they ended up going with the original Hadrian Gate. But it's cool because they actually have like wooden gates so you can kind of see what it would have looked like back then. This is also where you show your Jordan Pass or your ticket. Um, I recommend Jordan Pass because it saves you like $14. Um, so this is where you'll pay for it and um, main entrance, I suppose. But before we went through the South Gate, we wanted to check out the Visitor Center and it's just kind of tucked around a corner right next to the gate. The Visitor Center is tucked down in here. My understanding is this is where you can get a little handout that will explain things as they go along. And I've done a little bit of research, but when you're doing research on your own, sometimes you might not be telling the most up-to-date information. So I'm hoping we can go in here, learn a little bit more so we can teach you a little bit better on the other side. The museum is worth popping into for just a minute. There's really not a lot here. The highlight is the site. But there are a few cool little exhibits where you can see some of the more delicate things. So these cool little glass vases were sacramentary vases and they were actually used to hold the mourners tears according to Roman tradition. And based on the age and the color, this is probably the same type of glass that Dad was looking at earlier. So probably one of my favorite parts of archaeology is when you do actually get to find a bunch of pieces together. You hardly ever find a whole vessel sometimes. It looks like this one over here was at least relatively whole. It's got a crack right there. But what we usually find is a bunch of different sherds. And then it's like a puzzle for adult nerds like myself when we put them back together. And you hope that you find an entire one that's always really nice and it means that it was sitting where it was sitting when those people left it there. But unfortunately, there was no pamphlet in English. This is the layout. We came up into the Hippodrome here. We came back down here. They don't have the fountain structure here at all on it. Um, I don't know if they think that's from a later period or whatever, but it would have already had some of the temples built and it is quite expansive and we're going to go walk through all of this so uh, it's going to be really great once we did walk through that gate 
it was like the site opened up. There was just archeology span everywhere you looked. And I knew that this site was gonna be amazing. The visitor center had a lot of information about like artifacts that they didn't have like a map or anything like that. But luckily there are a bunch of these interpretive platforms that teach you about what was here. And here would have been barracks during the time of war. And then across is the souk, which is the, the marketplace. And so this young man was showing me that the uh, leaves are the same design that they used over here as a decorative element. They're very helpful. Shukra. Standing in front of the Oval Plaza, which is a really unique architectural design. It actually has like an oval shape, hence the name. And it was used to connect the Cardo, which is the road back here, to the Temple of Zeus. Because of buildings that were already here, there wasn't a straight line, so they had to create this oval design. It's really interesting that they used ionic columns around this plaza, and then the columns next to the road and the columns used to build the Temple of Zeus were actually Corinthian columns, which are the older version. Right over my shoulder is the Temple of Zeus. This is the largest and the highest of all of the temples here in Garasa or Jarash. It was built to honor Zeus Olympia in about 29 AD. And it's kind of ironic that it's larger than the Artemis Temple because Artemis was the god of the city. But it's uh, definitely been reconstructed very well. What happened was there was a lot of taking of the rock from here and some of the pavement in the oval platform is apparently from that. So were a bunch of Byzantine era churches that were built around here, but they have reconstructed it since. And it's really, really complete. I mean, it's not Athens or Paestum, but uh, it's super cool. Let's go take a look at it a little closer. So we're standing here by the Temple of Zeus, and this is kind of cool. I thought it was just up here on a natural hill, but it turns out that there was a sacred cave down in the hill that was here. And then afterwards, generation after generation, essentially built something on top of it, built something on top of it. And they have a use here all the way back to the Middle Bronze Age. And so this is really unique in that the way that they left it after excavation, you can see the different layers as people built it up and built it up until eventually the Romans made it into the Temple of Zeus. This is the inside of the Temple of Zeus, which was finished in 162 AD. And it's quite large, very beautiful. And you climb up these windy little narrow stairs, but it probably has the best view of the entire site. So it's definitely worth it, as long as you don't have a fear of heights. But afterwards, you head back down, and right next door is another really amazing portion of the site. Yeah, the Northern Theater is really large, and it's pretty impressive. And the cool thing about it was when we went there, there was actually these people playing like bagpipes and drums. And I, I don't understand exactly what bagpipes have to do with Jordanian culture, but uh, it was pretty fun. And it really showed the acoustics of the area, which was awesome. So we spent a little time walking around that, went all the way up to the top, had another really awesome view. I mean, I love theaters. The Greek and Roman world just have some really amazing theaters and this was not any exception to it. I actually heard that there was an even cooler theater and you guys are going to have to keep watching to check that one out, but man, the theaters at Jarosh were amazing. But after a little while, we wanted to head down and head back to the Oval Plaza so that we could go on the Cardo and see the rest of the site. You see a lot of these columns aren't lined up exactly right. That's because in 749 there was an earthquake and then they had to reconstruct it. And they did a pretty good job, but you can see some of it's not exactly perfect. The thing about the earthquake is 
it led to the downfall of the city and then the combination of different technologies changing. Sea trade became a lot more popular. So land trade, like spice trade and stuff like that. And this kind of area almost became a moot point by the end of the eighth century. So Brennan and I are walking down the Cardo, which is the old Roman road. And uh, this has been reconstructed really well. It's a little uneven, so you wanna watch your step and not your camera. But uh, there's all these cuts through here where you can actually see where the wheels of their carts kind of just wore slots in the road, which is cool. And I like to see that pretty much everywhere. We saw a lot of that in Pompeii and Herculaneum also. But this roadway with the columns running up and down it, it's definitely special. Moving. Okay, all right. Look at the key. Okay. Oh wow. oh, wow. The key is moving up and down because this is a column is moving anti seismic. He's not fall down. Flexibility, the same American of Japanese, this class paper, is what it's spring. And the Roman engineer inside, he put solid metal like a pin. And to earthquakes happen, he moves and doesn't fall down. And if you touch your finger here, you can feel it. Touch your finger. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. It was really fortunate we ran into that last gentleman. His name is Muhammad, and he is one of the guides, and it was kind of a slow day, so he's like, well, I'll just teach people something. Yeah, he taught us so much, and in fact, we were thinking about maybe putting that in this video, but it would have been like an hour long. So instead, we are going to have a second part next week, and that is gonna be all of the things that Muhammad taught us, and you guys are not gonna to wanna to miss that. The teachings of Muhammad. Should we call it that? Maybe we should. The central section of the Cardo just has so many different sites and ruins to see. I honestly think that the next time we're in the area, we might spend two days just exploring this site. So what we're walking into now is a Byzantine church. And this was built from a lot of the stones that were in the temple of Zeus. Before that, it was a temple to Dionysus. And uh, as with a lot of times when a new religion or a new place moves in, it uses what's there and repurposes it. And a lot of times that includes the locations because they're higher and they seem more important because they are. And we saw a Muslim mosque with Muhammad and now we're seeing a Byzantine church. And that church was really impressive, especially the cool fountain in the middle. And then there's like this raised altar that looked like a great place to teach you guys some stuff. Our microphone has died, so I'm gonna be a little loud. Luckily, God made me with a really loud mouth, especially standing here from the altar of the Church of St. Theodore. This looks like a really, really large temple up here, but that was because the Byzantines had repurposed 14 columns. It's actually very, very beautiful. And I want you guys to come up here and take a look at it. Keep in mind that in 749 was the last time this was used because of the earthquake we talked about earlier. The way the columns are oriented, it almost looks like a colonnaded street and it led directly to our next spot. Behind me is the temple of Artemis and this is actually the god that Karasa was built for. And the interesting thing about this temple is that it was started in the second century AD but it was never actually completed. They only built about 12 of the columns and they estimate it would have been about 32 for it to be complete. So that's really interesting that something so important was never actually even completed. And there were all these underground vaults that they've excavated underneath it. I'm gonna see if we can see any of that here. And they don't know exactly why they had the vaults down here. I was hoping we'd see it on the side, but we don't. So you'll just have to trust me, but it really has archeologists baffled. They don't know what the underground vaults were supposed to be for. I can imagine this would have been quite grand if they would have ever finished it. 
the quality of the marble stands out against all of the other marble that we've seen so far, as does like the girth and the height of the columns. And look how decorative the Corinthian tops are on this. They were really trying to do something big and really nice, and I wish they would have finished it. The inner sanctum looks to be very complete. There would have been a big statue of Artemis in here in the center, in the little portico. You can get pomegranate juice up here, which is always nice on a clear day. You can see in here, I'll see if I can get you a picture without all the bars here. So the center of this is really well reconstructed and it was going to be a pretty large statue that they would have had up there. The double archway is nice. They were planning on supporting a pretty large roof to do that double archway there. It's something that I first saw in the Mosquita but it's something that I've found all over the Greek and Roman world. Beautifully redone though. As far as the interior of a temple from this period, it's one of the more complete that I've ever seen. And you do kind of have access to it a lot more than you do in other places. Well, it turns out there is an entrance into here that isn't gated closed and this is a side entrance. So if you guys are here, and you're like me and you think, oh, only guides are allowed in there. At least for today, it's not true. So we're gonna head on into the side here and you can really get a closer look at uh, how everybody else knew this except for me. Um, but uh, you can really get a nice close look at the uh, little portico here where the goddess herself would have been put and where people could come and worship. The double archway here. Again, this is going to add support. It's not just decorative. And it would have had a mosaic all through here. I bet it's in a museum somewhere. But uh, I really love the color blue that they use here. It's real washed out. Really nice. We found the access to one of these tunnels, so I'm going to go down there and hopefully the lighting isn't too bad. You guys can take a look at what we were talking about there. So the lighting wasn't great down there, but luckily we were able to turn on the flashlight and give you guys a little bit of light. Hopefully it's not too grainy, but uh, please bear with us. I can see the confusion for what the purpose of these tunnels were. Um, I can't even think of anything. Maybe it was like an underground prayer place only for the priests. It's got all these nice little like cut through windows though. And it is a lot cooler in here. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just like early air conditioned because the priest didn't want to be out there when it's hot because yeah, I maybe. can imagine it feels warm today and it's only like 75 degrees on a really warm Jordanian summer day. This might feel really nice. So right next to this theater we're about to go into is the Agora. And just like the Agora, any other Roman place, this was a really important area. They did a lot of their trading here, and they even had some political speeches here. The preservation slash restoration of the theaters here is magical. They do a music convention here. It's called Jirash, and then uh, I think it's Jirash Music Festival. I'm not sure, I'll have to put the little blurb up here. But uh, they have concerts apparently in like 14 different locations here in the old city. I believe it's in March. I'll put the dates of next year's up for you. This has the upper passageways restored. 
really gorgeous, much smaller than the original one, a little less crowded, and no bagpipes. And from up in the cheap seats, the view of the floor was amazing. And another thing that stood out were the sky knife fronds, which is like kind of like the backstage decorative part of any theater. And then if you climb up even higher, you get another great view of almost the entire site. Along the edges here and along some of the other ones, there are sculptures. Uh, this looks like almost like a cherub and then this is a harp player so it's possible that it was from the performances that were in this theater which is a really cool little touch and and this is a really beautiful beautiful theater I would have loved to watch a show sitting in these stands we'll have to come back one March and watch the music festival absolutely it's places like this amazing places that we didn't even really know about when we wrote our bucket list that just really reinforce the fact that we need to just go everywhere in the world because there's so many hidden treasures and you guys need to do the same. These stones here were actually the crossbars or the pediments that connected the columns and it had little gaps in them. So you saw how the columns move. It'd be kind of like a warning sign for earthquakes because this is called music stone. So it's like a warning bell. And that would tell you to get the heck out of there or you're gonna get crushed by a column or something. And that is yet another thing we learned from Muhammad and we're gonna take it as like the bell that says it is time for us to get the heck out of your face. We are really glad that you stuck around. And here's a little footage of me playing around with the music studs for you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had such a great time. And I hope you guys find yourself in Jordan soon and find yourself in Jarosh. And no matter where you go, make sure you always find, find yourself, yourself on, on the journey. journey.